I'm here to talk to you today about a large scale project that's happening in my home state of Tasmania that I'm spearheading. Um, it's bringing together multidisciplinary researchers with citizens from all walks of life. And although it's a new kind of project, I suppose you can probably say it's been about 65,000 years or more in the making. So in this next slide, as you'll see, archaeology for me has been a lifelong love affair. Like many others, it probably started with Steven Spielberg's Indiana Jones world or something like that, but it, it quickly escalated when I found the amazing historic sites around Hobart, Tasmania, Australia more broadly, and of course, international. A lot of my knowledge of history, both worldwide and closer to home, came from people like my grandfather, who they shared their, their knowledge of astronomy and history and sciences and everything. And essentially, when they share their life experiences, um, you know, it, it passes down just like Indigenous cultures of the world, it passes down in oral traditions, the stories. I remember going to the Eureka Stockade as a kid, and that was in Victoria. And I remember being a little bit shocked, I guess, at the amount of times the guides would say, I don't know, to an answer to questions about what happened at the particular sites, or, uh, you know, what there's a story I've heard about the Goldfield Re Rebellion. And even though this data was widely available, um, it just, you know, it's, it's siloed, like a lot of history information, it's actually siloed and hard to find. So when I went on to study um, historical sciences formally, I remember hearing things like, Australia doesn't have a history compared to places like Europe. I mean, what's 200 years compared to um, 10,000 years in ancient Egypt? Not only is that information grossly incorrect, it's damaging to generations of Australian students. Not only was that information grossly incorrect, I mean, it was damaging to generations of Australian students, and not to mention the invalidation of the many amazing Indigenous cultures around the world, whose sites may no longer be visible. Um, they, their, their stories are passed down in the oral tradition, just like it was with my grandfather. And I remember saying, we need to capture these, we, we can't lose them, we need, to, we need to show these sites as they were, so people can experience them. And on to the next slide. As this is a presentation about manipulating time, we're going to fast forward just a few years um, to when I began my research career in computer science. I realised I could bring together all these missing elements of the historical information and, and visualisation that I was talking about, um, just about the way history is presented. So stories not being captured, sites, of course, being lost to time, and bring them together using technology. So in this slide, um, to get started, I worked with the Maritime Museum of Tasmania to design and prototype visualisation software. Um, this was about capturing stories from their patrons, from their own archives, the Australian archives, as well as members of the public. Um, and it was regarding the artefacts in the museum, but also it gives people a much better um, look at the, the, the stories behind these artefacts, more than just a plaque. So for example, I had no idea, if you look at the, the diving suit here on the slide, that that, that actual suit had been the, the site of an epic battle with a wily cephalopod. Um, but a member of the public did know this. They knew the diver, they knew it, and I captured this story in this particular app. It, it helped educate people on the diving suit. So onto the slide here. The success of this idea has led to the project that's being unveiled here in this particular presentation, which has been affectionately dubbed Project Serendipity, um, in honour of the fact that it's encouraging people to forge unexpected connections with objects and unexpected um, visualize, uh, unexpected journeys through the data based on what they can visualize. Um, and also capturing data, any new data will actually help forge new connections. So the project connect, uh, consists of data collection, analysis and visualization all happening at once, which is unusual. So a citizen science platform will, um, it will house things like drone footage, 360 degree video, stories, anything at all. Um, and users will be um, encouraged to participate by both by contributing to the data itself, as well as obviously helping to analyze the data that's already there, drone footage, et cetera. Visualizations are in the form of VR and AR for a bit of immersion as well, um, but there of course will be the non-immersive um, web app, de app design interfaces. Um, but the whole idea about this is to make this information and the data freely available to people. This is something that's sorely missing in historical research, um, the siloing of information, as I mentioned. Um, history is like, in this way, if we don't capture it, history is likely to be lost to time as easily as if it's bulldozed, as we know is happening. So this project puts the art of um, participating in preserving archeological sites back into the hands of the people. 
So in this next slide, um, the uniqueness of the project lies in the accessibility. Um, the core of the project and the rollout of the platform will use consumer level technology for this reason. It, it does, it's actually to encourage wider adoption of this idea and hopefully foster some willingness to participate. LiDAR tech or um, light detection and ranging um, tech trial has been the really small modules that fit on consumer level drones and they cost less than 200 Australian dollars. Um, they're small enough to be mounted pretty much on anything. 360 degree footage, as you can see, is um, done on GoPro Max and Fusion type of um, cameras because they are widely available and consumer level um, and mostly affordable for people as well. So the citizen science platform will encourage the use of also consumer um, modeling software, things like Blender, um, if people are willing to participate in creating some of this um, VR and AR material. So as seen here in the visualization on the slide, um, this is from Takeshi Inamata's uh, LiDAR project, Discovering Mayan Sites, um, this in 2019. Um, LiDAR has been decided as the most, the best um, technology to use of over and above radar, simply for affordability, as well as the fact that um, it's the best choice for viewing outlines of sites, um, simply because of um, it, it's a more focused beam and high spatial resolution. Operating costs are dramatically lower for LiDAR as well. But participants are not required to use any of this technology. This is for us to use as well, um, but they, it will show that the technology is no longer out of reach for people. Working with Indigenous sites will also be done with the full involvement and guidance of Aboriginal communities. The next slide. For our citizen science participants, um, public access to historic sites allows amateur historians, uh, amateur historians as themselves, to collect fantastic data, such as these images here. These are of the Willow Court Asylum in New Norfolk, Tasmania. Willow Court, for everybody, is um, where they housed the disabled and mentally ill patients. Um, it's a historic site that was in use far before um, the famous Port Arthur site here. So it's, it, makes it, it makes it around 200 years old. As our citizen science scientists actually found out, however, um, the asylum was still in use as an asylum in the year 2000. So yes, it's a historic site, but it's got a really dark um, history that is actually really not history for us. It's, it's, it's common and it's new and it's contemporary. And the shock on some of the testers faces when they found this out was amazing. These people are still alive today and they have stories of their own, which hopefully will be captured. Um, as you can see, um, access to some of these rooms is restricted due to the dilapidation of the buildings, but it's amazing in these situations what a selfie stick can capture. And another example is the female factory prison site, which is sort of sandwiched away in the centre of Hobart between sort of a church and a chocolate factory. And um, that, that has to be mapped by LIDAR because there's lots of stories about where things happened in the site, but obviously there's, there's no LIDAR footage of this to be able to map out those outlines. On, for any, anything else, um, we can, anyone with a mobile phone can capture data these days, and that's what we're trying to encourage. The next slide. Currently, I'm dialing up the community and school outreach to draw attention both to the project and also to get the conversation happening um, with people, um, hopefully talk, get people talking and sharing their knowledge uh, in preparation. And we're expecting around a 2021 rollout of at least the beta versions of these platforms. Um, at the moment, we've got collaborations with criminologists and historians, and that's expanding the interest in this particular um, endeavour as well. Um, as I said, it's a first for Tasmania, something that we have to come to terms with. It's quite bizarre because of uh, Tasmania was such a rich and dark and varied past. Next slide. And please follow me at any of the social media handles here if you want to know any more and have updates about this particular project. I'm happy to talk to anybody. We're looking for um, collaborations and um, a, a, any sort of EOIs on um, participating or advising on this project. And we're excited to bring this amalgamation of techno-archaeology to fruition after much planning and, and testing of this particular technology. So we're currently at the point now where we're negotiating access to Indigenous sites with elders. Um, and we will be reaching out to Indigenous scientists and communicators um, who might like to be involved in um, sharing their stories and their histories as well. So thanks for your interest in this talk and enjoy the Congress.